You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. Hey TYT, I'm Nomi Konst here in Beverly Hills where I'm about to interview the legendary, iconic Hollywood producer, Norman Lear. His hits from the 70s gained a lot of note because they often reflected the politics of the time and influenced the politics of the time. He's behind shows like All in the Family, The Jeffersons, Maud, Sanford and Son, and he went on to produce films in the 90s as well. Uh, Mr. Lear recently tweeted out himself taking the knee back in World War II where he served over 52 combat missions and then put that against a photo from him today taking the knee in support of Colin Kaepernick's uh, taking the knee and the NFL. Mr. Lear is going to be honored later this year at the Kennedy Center and it is going to be an, a privilege and a wonderful opportunity to hear uh, his reflections on history, on politics and what he thinks about where we are today. Mr. Lear. Yes, ma'am. You served in World War II. Yes. 52 combat missions, uh, there has been so much in your life in terms of politics, the way that the world has, has shifted. Recently you took a photo and you matched it up with another photo and tweeted it out of you taking the knee. What is the significance of taking the knee given your understanding of history? Well, a ball player uh, who was protesting uh, something that he felt un-American, refused in some game, I'm not conversant with the game or something, uh, to sing the Star Spangled Banner without indicating he had a problem. Mm -hmm. So he dropped to one knee. Now maybe that was done before and I just never knew that that was the way to show uh, some, uh, not against the Star Spangled Banner or against America, but a practice or something that was happening that was, in the eyes of this uh, ball player, un-American, mm -hmm. dropped to a knee. Uh, a lot of controversy about that. I thought he had every right to indicate he had a problem uh, and dropped to his knee. And yeah. so I found, or someone found, a photograph of me in World War II, wow. uh, you know, 21 years old, on one knee. So I took a picture on my knee at this age, probably dressed pretty much like this, and we ran the two together, or they put them up on the Twitter mm -hmm. together. Uh, I think something like 10 million people. Yes, <laughs> you went viral. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, with your, your history, you know, your, your life spans um, several decades, you're 95 years old. You were in World War II, you witnessed the rise of fascism before, and here we are again watching uh, fascism rise globally, whether in Germany, in France, in the United States. What do you think we can do to fight fascism, understanding uh, that we've been here before? I, I can't, uh, it's amazing that you're asking me that question because uh, you're, leaps ahead of where the, the culture is generally, mm. you young Turk, you. <laughs> Using the word fascism in, fascism in the context of what is going on mm -hmm. now and what is increasing mm -hmm. across uh, our culture. And I think you're absolutely right, uh, but it takes a leap of understanding and prescience and courage in the media to express it as honestly as you did. Well, I, I, you know, we look at these trends. You know, the, the economy collapsed in the late 20s and populism rose and then populism was used as a tool of the mm -hmm. far right. And so we're seeing this all happen again with populism on the left and the right. Um, so it's, it's concerning. And you know, Dwight David Eisenhower, who uh, as you know, as a two-term Republican president, mm -hmm. the five-star general, speaking of World War II, the five-star general that led us through World War II. As a World War II veteran, I, mm -hmm. you know, always devoted to him. It's interesting that not a single Republican, hmm. there were 17 running for the presidency at one time, running for the nomination at one time, 
But you don't hear Dwight David Eisenhower's name invoked by a Republican anywhere, anytime, and it's because he warned us about the question you just raised. When he warned us about a military industrial complex that he saw growing and was and we should be concerned about. His first draft, you may not know, it was a military industrial congressional complex in his first draft. Somebody or he uh, dropped the congressional. But I think it's exactly what you're talking about, uh, which, which was inherent in your question, uh, because that's a kind of corporate takeover underneath, which is much more fascistic than democratic mm -hmm. mode. You have been an advocate for the First Amendment and also on Nixon's enemy list. What did that mean? Well, you have to ask Mr. Nixon what it meant <laughs> in his case. I don't know. Well, he was, uh, he complained. Uh, there was an episode on All in the Family where Archie, having left the house because his son had a gay friend or somebody that he suspected was gay, because mm. he had an umbrella. <laughs> if you're carrying an umbrella, uh, you're gay. Anyway, <laughs> he was upset that, and he went to his uh, the bar, uh, Kelsey's, and he's sitting with a guy he's known for some years who happens to be just he admires him as much as anybody in the world. He was a former uh, halfback mm. per, on a professional football team. And uh, Archie tells him about his uh, son-in-law and his gay friend. Mm. And they're doing, they're arm wrestling as they're talking. And the football player says, well, you know, I'm... And Carol goes, no. <laughs> I wish I could do Carol O'Connor, he's so great. And he says, oh, yes, Archie, have you ever heard me talk about a woman? Have you ever mentioned, heard me talk, going out with a woman? And it was just the greatest moment, mm. the greatest moment. Uh, so Nixon talked about that, and I have it on, I, I have it, because uh, it was part of the Nixon tapes. And uh, he, he talks to Haldeman, uh, who is his associate, about uh, how they're ruining that show. Mm. You know, they, they got a good guy, and they're, uh, they're killing him with this stuff. They're killing the character with this stuff. And he said, you know, uh, Greece, <laughs> speaking of Greece, Greece uh, went down because of homosexuality not homosexual, because of the homos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm quoting Nixon now. <laughs> that was the end of democracy for Greece. That was the end of democracy for <laughs> Greece, yeah. I think he, he had a misunderstanding of history, <laughs> speaking of. <laughs> a misunderstanding, yeah. So, uh, you know, w with this mention of Archie Bunker and, and homosexuality and Nixon's tapes, you also, you know, you infused quite a bit of, of politics in, in your television work, in your art. At what point in your life, did you realize that your art was making such a difference in affecting culture? You know, I don't recall having had such a moment. Mm. Uh, I was raising, uh, I had three kids, or two kids and three kids at the time All in the Family came about. Uh, we had lots of problems and uh, and, they, and problems we didn't have, they had up the street, across the street, down the street from us. So there was nothing we were dealing with that wasn't there to deal with. Mm -hmm. Everybody was living through the same culture, same problems that existed for all of us. And uh, so I didn't think we were doing anything. Of course, but we had to talk politics. Mm -hmm. That was part of our lives. Did you seek out these stories? I mean, so many of the stories that you presented before the screen were, you know, were, were very different. You, you portrayed African-American households from all different demographics, um, financial demographics. But they weren't different from the way I knew them. 
right. they were different from the way they were uh, represented right. on television mm -hmm. to that point. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had been in black family homes and they were very much like the rest of us, right. you know, human beings. In Maud, uh, there was a notable scene right before Roe v. Wade and a, a, an abortion was depicted. Uh -huh. This was at a time, uh, which we'll touch on in a minute, when you know the Christian right was rising. What does being a feminist mean to you? Being a feminist means to me having five daughters. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, we were doing these shows when the feminist movement was mm -hmm. happening. Uh, so had to deal it with Maud, had to deal it with uh, with uh, Edith in her relationship with Archie. She picked it up uh, because it was there for her as it was for every woman to grow a bit stronger. And uh, I'll never forget a scene where uh, she lets Archie have it. It was huh. at the uh, one month when you know, the newspapers or art, magazine articles were wondering if this was the height of the uh, women's movement. Mm. And the show had to do with that, and she laid him out. How did the Christian right react? So when we did the abortion episode, nobody knew what was coming. When it went on the air, mm -hmm. nobody knew ahead of time what was going to be on the air. Nothing. Hmm. No, not a single state seceded from the Union, you know. <laughs> there, there was very little. Uh, of course, we got some mail, but, but nothing, given that it was a national and highly rated. When it went into reruns three months later, four months later, they knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. the, the religious right knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. They lay down in front of Mr. Paley, the owner of the network, in, in front of his car in New York. They lay down in front of my car in California and carried on. And the mail was huge and uh, everything they could do, they did. And it makes the great, it makes the, the best way I have of making the point that the American people, if they're not the best educated, mm. they are wise of heart. They understand, you know, the, the, the show about abortion didn't trouble them at all. They, they, they knew neighbors and aunts and cousins who had abortions. Mm -hmm. In the late 70s, you were working on a film about the Christian right. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it uh, now, how significant would that have been to how what? Have, significant would it have been to have had a film depicting the rise of the Christian right? Well, I still think about it. Hmm. You know, it's called religion. We still think about it. It's a great story. I we've done over the years maybe three scripts that I just haven't liked well enough after working our hearts out to get it right. Uh, so it's a possibility. It's, a, it's still a maybe. I'm finally doing a show about elderly people that I wrote this script seven years ago wow. called Guess Who Died? And uh, 15 years before that, 20 odd years ago, I was doing it as a... Uh, as an illus il not illustrated, what's the word? Animated? Uh, Animated? Uh, animated show called uh, Till the Fat Lady Sings. That was the title. And we did a six minute piece on it with Aunt Bancroft played a character, Kirk Douglas played a character, voice, uh, Bill William Shallert. I mean, it was a great mm -hmm. cast and very funny. Finally, uh, we're doing it and NBC is making it. Who's in it? Can you tell us? Hmm? Can you tell us who's in it? I can't tell you who's in it because all of this came about just now. We're oh. just starting to cast. Breaking news. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so, uh, the business of Hollywood and, and pretty much every business has shifted. Every industry has shifted with the rise of big business. And you were there to experience it firsthand, to witness it firsthand. Do you think that there's a way for uh, shows like yours or, or any show or piece of art really with the political 
um, agenda or reflection of the politics of the moment to break so through? Sure, sure. Well, The Simpsons is there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other animated show, my good friends Matt and Trey, mm -hmm. and what's the show? Uh, the uh, oh goodness, <laughs> what's the name of the show? Uh, oh, my South good Park. friends, South Park. South Park. Yes, 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 South Park. <laughs> uh, I mean, South Park is Brilliant. gloriously political mm -hmm. and daring, and uh, Seth MacFarlane goes there. Mm -hmm. There, uh, there's a lot of great comedy about. Where do you think the limitations are? Politically, uh, limitations. Yeah, the boundaries. Where, what can you not cross? Is I don't know that there are there are boundaries that mm -hmm. people make uh, just arbitrarily. Mm. But uh, and there are boundaries of good taste, and that varies with the individual. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I don't see real boundaries. Mm. You have said that you hustled your way into Hollywood. You, you worked very hard to get to get in. Um, you didn't come from wealth. You didn't come from a, a family that was established in Hollywood, and you became uh, one of the most powerful producers in this in this town. What advice would you give to a young person watching as the industry is changing so much? What kind of advice would you give them if they wanted go, to go up? go with your gut? Hmm. It's the best thing you've got going. And uh, don't let anybody tell you you can't if you have the determination and the, the true belief in what you want to do, go with it. That's great. How much of your energy in, in your day is devoted to art? To art? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. What do you mean by art You're, when you say you, you art? You work in I mean, film, all, uh, you know. Creation. We're, we're, we've got uh, One Day at a Time on the air. We just finished the second season. Mm -hmm. uh, that second season of shows, 13 shows, will be on the air in January. It won't mm -hmm. be on t until January. So we're very much cooking uh, art. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Do you ever, how much time do you take off? For downtime, you're 95 years old, still working. I am. It's amazing. I'm 95. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> it surprises the hell out of me too. Yeah, you're producing. You're still working. Around. I I I like it. I'm leaving tomorrow for uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. People from the American Way. Uh, speaking of the religious right, an article, mm -hmm. I, uh, an organization that I founded with others. Uh, to fight the religious right, mm -hmm. as I saw it proliferating across the television screen, show after show after show, mixing politics and religion. And uh, this, anyway, yeah, they're throwing me a 95th birthday party in Chicago and one in New York, and of course, fundraising. Of course, fundraising. <laughs> With that being said, uh, fundraising is, is very important in politics. And oh, yes, and seen, birthdays are, are very important in fundraising. <laughs> that, that's, who knew your birthday could be, become a commodity? <laughs> it's the way it is. It's the way it is, and, um, and it's gotten worse over the years. We just had a $1 billion presidential race that the Democrats lost. What do you think Hillary Clinton did wrong and right? And what can we learn from this last election? What Hillary Clinton did wrong was she lost. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, when he was coming along, he, Trump, was coming along and it looked like there was a possibility, mm -hmm. I thought he represents, I still think, mm -hmm. this minute, he represents the middle finger of the American right hand. Mm. American people do not have leadership anywhere. They don't have leadership in, among the Democrats more than they do among the Republicans. Mm -hmm. There's nobody in it for them, exclusively for them. Mm -hmm. Not the next election, not the next fund, uh, funding drive, but to get it right for them. Mm -hmm. 
And so they were saying, this is what you want, to, this is what you're throwing our way, mm -hmm. take that. And uh, I think today he represents that. Mm. When do you think the Democratic Party lost its way? Over a considerable period of time. Uh, when it gave up, as it has, the flag and the Bible. Mm. The flag and the Bible, if I were to, if this started with the question, who does the flag, if left or right, who does the flag and the Bible belong to? You'd have to say the right, they use it more. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I understand the Bible, uh, in terms of the simple things, love thy neighbor, uh, care for the, those who need, require it. Democrats lean more in that direction than, the left leans more in that direction than the right. Mm -hmm. How do they bring back that morality? How do they make it front and center? It's, I think it starts with, going back to leadership again, people talking to us about it, making mm -hmm. it a discussion and not in bumper sticker patriot, you know, where all patriot talks, right. but in what makes us who we are. That First Amendment, that Bill of Rights, that guarantee that everybody is equal, mm. uh, equal treatment under the law, equal justice under the law. What was the significance of buying the Declaration of Independence? It was a... Uh, idea that came to me when I read that, that Sotheby's was auctioning it off on the net. That was an interesting thing. Never had happened before. Uh, <clears throat> and then I learned when I called a friend at Sotheby's that he had it in his office. Uh -huh. And from here, we are on the second floor, and we walked over to the Sotheby's uh, office. I looked at it, I was with somebody I looked at her to make sure she didn't see I was crying, and she was crying. Oh my goodness. And uh, I knew before I came back to the office that if I could get it, it would travel. Hmm. People, I, from my reaction to it, uh, I knew people should see it across the country. And everything came together very quickly. Uh, I don't know, two weeks later, there was a guy out here that came, wanted to see me to talk to me about something, ran a major company. I told him what, what I was doing, and uh, he said, how much do you think it's going to take? I said, $30 million. He said, you got 15. He put his hand out. Oh, my goodness. So that's how it came together. Like it, it's incredible. Yeah, you, it was great. What was and the so we did 50 states. And in most states, many, many cities. Mm. And I had the joy of watching people who were standing with lines around the block, waiting an hour to get to that document, mm. and standing there with kids and crying, and teachers who were talking about always trying to raise the money to take a class to D.C. to see such a document. Mm. And here it was, right there and there in their city hall or library. Or, it was great. Do you think there's a magic pill or some sort of solution that will excite Americans uh, into caring about their government? So many Americans stay home from voting. Some of it is intentional, some of it is by design, gerrymandering, a lot of different voter suppression. But what would it take to, to inspire Americans? I think you could be that pill. Me? Is that... <laughs> You're doing a good job here. Yeah. Thank you. It's obvious you understand and obvious you care. Mm. Well, it's obvious you care. And I do, I do. Where does that come from? Because I think it comes from understanding mm. that, you know, people have a way of saying and feeling, I'm only a boat, one boat. Uh, and I'm understanding, there's, uh, if I can remember this, there's an old, I think it's Yiddish, but uh, a man should have a garment with two pockets. In the first pocket should be a piece of paper on which is written, I am but dust and ashes. Mm. I am that proverbial grain of sand on the beach of life. Mm. 
in the other pocket a piece of paper on which is written, for me the world was created. Mm. Proof of that exists in the fact that it took you every split second of your life to hear me say that. Wow. Every bit of your life was about getting to hear me say that. And it's going to be about something else when this conversation is over. And every bit of my 95 years, I've lived to get to this moment and see you sitting there with that pad on your lap and the smile on your face and this lovely man with a camera. Mm -hmm. He, he had no idea. Mm -hmm. This is what his life is about at this moment. Mm -hmm. Took him every split second to get here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Daniel. <laughs> now, at some point, a lot of people are going to see, I hope for the sake of the Young Turks, a lot of people will see this film. Mm -hmm. It will have taken everybody watching at the moment they're watching every second of their lives to get to it. Huh. So how important is living in the moment and how important is being that, in, that human being mm -hmm. for whom the world was created? Mm -hmm. I've heard oh, you talk about the... Love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. <I love> it. <laughs> I've heard you talk about the universe and the significance of understanding perspective and our place in the universe. Uh, in perspective with others, what do you want to leave? What, what, what lessons, art, stories, do you want to leave with the universe? Well, I just did a pretty good job. You did. You yeah. did. <laughs> I, I, Hopefully that's not it. I'll leave that. Hopefully it is it. Hopefully it is it. I'd like to, you know, there are two little words we don't pay enough attention to. They, simple little words, over and next. When something is over, over. Mm -hmm. And we're all on to next. But if there was a hammock in the middle of those two words, that would be the best definition of living in the moment. Mm. And given that it's taking every split second to get to this moment, why well, I gotta live it. It's beautiful. Gives me hope. Hopefully it gives all of us hope. I'm yes. glad about that. So many young people who, who can learn from your lessons and, and your advice along the way. Any parting words for the millennial generation that... Uh, Where'd you go to school? Where did I, I went to University of Arizona. At where? Arizona. Arizona. Mm -hmm. A long to time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> to study... Political science. Shocker. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. But I have, I have uh, twin daughters who are 22. And one great just graduated Harvard, the other Vassar. Congratulations. Uh, but the Harvard girl reminds me, you remind me of oh, her. That's I think she's going to go in this direction. Well, if we can help in any way, I'm happy to. I, I would say the best advice and lessons that I learned were probably from my grandfather. And he died a few months ago, and so I oh, love speaking. Thank you. He was 92, but I love learning from from elders because they've seen yeah. it all, and you know you can only read so many books. What, what did he do, your granddad? He uh, he was an immigrant, and he um, my grandmother was actually the breadwinner. She had a, a she was a designer, a fabric designer. But they escaped Albania, uh, but they're Greek, and they escaped, and he you know he lived under fascism and communism, and had a very incredible life, but he was there supporting my grandmother, you know, doing the books and a That's lot of great. lot of history. He was there the last day reading the newspaper, asking for it. So it's it's good to, to learn from our elders. And I hopefully, you know, our audience can learn from you. No, yeah, it's great. Somebody once said, Each man is my superior in that I may learn from him. Mm. And uh, I never thought so I heard anything more correct than that. There's something to learn from everybody. What's the greatest piece of advice you've been given? I've been given? Mm -hmm. uh, I had a writer's block a good many years ago, I mean, several times, but I, I was in really deep shit <coughs> with, with a writer's block. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, I went to see a uh, psychologist, and he said to me, he, told, uh, he asked me how I worked, and I told him, described how I worked. And he said, uh, you know, Norman, 60 people, <laughs> 80 people, 
in a small room and somebody yells fire, they rush to one door, they don't all get out unless they go two at a time, 384. Hmm. He said, oh, your ideas are like that too. Let them all out. You, you adjust them according to age or weight or hairstyle or whatever after they get out that door. They got to get out first. Hmm. So he suggested I dictate. I bought myself a, uh, a, a dictation machine and I dictated most of my career. Wow. See, I've been waiting my whole life to hear that. Yes, yes. And you're, you're writing too. Oh my goodness, <laughs> what a great piece of advice. Well, Dictation was now they're, the, you know, mm -hmm. people come in here to interview me, mm -hmm. major publications, and they mm -hmm. put a little record <laughs> on the table. They never double check it. Yep. They're so trustworthy. But anyway, I did that for years. It's great. Well, Mr. Lear, thank you. You're welcome. Thank this you. This was a pleasure and yeah. honor. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Everything led to well, this moment. Well, not, not if you call again. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you'll answer. I'll answer. Thank you very much. Right. You're welcome. You're welcome. If you liked this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member. Only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join and you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school, and all the commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.